Hello, everyone. OCHA Center for Humanitarian Data is very pleased to welcome you to this HDX dataset deep dive on the relative wealth index. Please note this event is being recorded. My name is Suji, and on the center's behalf, I'm very pleased to introduce the first of our four presenters. The center's HDX data manager, Meta Sebia Salu, now has the floor to start our session. Thanks so much, Suji, and thank you all for joining our fifth webinar in the HDX dataset deep dive series. Uh, for those of you joining our series for the first time, these webinars are intended to offer a comprehensive understanding on data sets that are hosted on the HDX platform by bringing on data owners and subject matter experts to give explanations. Uh, Suji mentioned today's webinar uh, will feature the Relative Wealth Index dataset, uh, which is developed by the Data for Good team at Meta, formerly known as uh, Facebook. So we are very pleased to welcome our presenters uh, today. Laura McGorman, Public Policy Manager with Data for Good at Meta. Alex Pompey, Research Manager also with Data for Good at Meta. Joshua Blumenstock, Associate Professor with the University of California, Berkeley. Once again, welcome. We're very excited to have you with us today. So to get things started, uh, next slide, please. Uh, let me quickly walk you through uh, today's agenda. Uh, so I'll start by giving you an overview on the HDX uh, on the center and the HDX platform. Uh, Laura will give us an overview on the tools and data that are made publicly available by the team at Meta. Then Alex will take us through an in-depth uh, look into the Relative Wealth Index dataset. Finally, Joshua will showcase some of the real-world applications of the Relative Wealth Index dataset. And after these presentations, I'll come back for, for the second part to moderate the panel discussion, where we will have time to address some of the questions or comments coming from you, our audience. So please continue to use the chat box to leave us your questions or comments as the presentations progress. Okay, next slide. OCHA Center for Humanitarian Data was established in 2017 in The Hague with the mission to increase the use and impact of data and humanitarian response. Um, next slide. The center's work focuses on these uh, four areas. In data services, we work to increase interoperability through data standards and integrated systems. In data responsibility, we work towards increasing trust and cooperation across organizations sharing data. In data literacy, our focus is in increasing uh, capability of people to access and use data. And in predictive analytics, we work around developing new predictive models and supporting or peer reviewing partners, partners models. And in particular, it's worth mentioning here uh, the work on anticipatory action and the center's role uh, supporting OCHA's, uh, OCHA and partners in getting ahead of a shock and mitigating its impact. So uh, share the, the link will be shared in the chat for further information on the topic. So the HDX or the Humanitarian Data Exchange is an, op an open platform for sharing uh, humanitarian data across crisis and organizations. We had over 1.3 million unique users coming to the platform in 2021. Our database currently hosts thousands of data sets uh, coming from different sources and organizations, of which 298 are actively sharing their data. So for more on HDX, uh, next slide please. Uh, I invite you to take a look at this uh, year in review blog by the Center's Data Partnership Team Lead, Javier Terran, which was published beginning of this year. Uh, the link will be provided in the chat box. In addition, I also invite you to sign up to share data and join the growing HDX community. And of course, if you have difficulty getting started or finding data on the platform, you can reach out to us via our email 
hdx at humdata.org. Okay, so moving on, uh, before I give the floor to our speakers today, I'd like to quickly highlight one of our products, the data grid. The main goal of the data grid is to present what critical data is available and missing in different crisis locations uh, so that all of us can be more focused with data sharing and outreach. Uh, what you see on the screen is the data grid page for Afghanistan, where availability of data sets across six categories and 21 subcategories is shown. And I'd like to mention here the center's yearly state of open humanitarian data report is coming out end of this month and will contain detailed analysis on the data grids. So I invite you to follow the center's website for updates on that. So with that, and with no further delay, I give the floor to Laura to take us through the tools and data from the Data for Good team at Meta. Laura, the floor is yours. Thanks so much. Um, it's wonderful to, to be able to present with the Center for Humanitarian Data, and I'd just like to start by uh, expressing my gratitude to the whole community at OCHA and the Center for Humanitarian Data for the partnership we've had to date. To share a little bit about our partnership with OCHA, we have been working for the past several years to make HDX one of our primary vehicles through which we share publicly available data. The Data for Good program at Meta is somewhat unique in that we have a number of tools that are available through license agreement, but we have many more tools that are fully publicly available and open source for any humanitarian government or even commercial entity to use. And I'm going to spend just a few minutes walking you through some of our most popular data sets that you can access right now on HDX before we do a deep dive on the Relative Wealth Index. Our most popular tool by far are called high resolution population density maps. These are tools that are built with primarily satellite information, satellite data, as well as census information. And what we do is we identify structures in the satellite imagery, which we purchase for the entire world. And using the identification of structures, we're able, able to estimate at a 30 meter resolution how populations are distributed across a country. And this is incredibly helpful because for any of you who are, who are sort of super users of census data sets, you may find that it's not sufficient to know that there's potentially 10,000 children under five in a particular ward or a particular municipality. When you're going house to house to deliver vaccines or when you're trying to determine what villages might be vulnerable to flooding, it's really important to know the exact distribution of where people live. And so our population density maps were downloaded several hundred thousand times from HDX last year, and they were also accessed through AWS nearly 5 million times last year. So if, you, if you're feeling like, I don't know where to get started with Data for Good at Meta Tools, we strongly recommend you take a look at our high resolution population density maps as a start because we find that almost every decision that public policymakers or humanitarians around the world are, are taking a look at does need to be informed by accurate population estimates. Uh, one of our other most uh, popular tools on HDX are called movement range maps. These are daily updated statistics on human mobility that have been primarily used in the context of COVID-19 to estimate the rate at which populations are generally staying home and changes in mobility at a subnational level compared to a pre-pandemic baseline. <clears throat> These tools have been used widely by governments around the world to monitor and measure the effectiveness of lockdown orders, but they've also been used in other ways. We find that mobility is a readable and really uh, multi-purpose tool. So for example, there was a recent paper done by CSIS in Indonesia that used our movement range maps to proxy GDP in certain Indonesian regions. Uh, it looks like mobility can be sort of a, a leading indicator of commerce. And we've also seen a number of people use it to estimate the growth of certain transport infrastructure in Europe. So a wide range of applications, most primarily focused again on sort of mobility as it relates to COVID-19 stay at home orders, but a wide range of, of ways to look at that data as well. Thirdly, we have a tool that's also very popular called the Social Connectedness Index. This is a pretty uh, bespoke tool that only really a social media company like ours could release. And this is an international index of the density of friendship ties across subnational areas around the world. 
So we could be looking at friendship ties between New York City and San Francisco, but we could also be looking at friendship ties between Bogota and uh, Eastern Europe. And so what has been really interesting about the release of this data set that has been live for about two years is that we also find that social connections are a really fascinating covariate and proxy for a bunch of things. This includes things like cross-national trade, cross-national financial flows and lending, as well as even things like COVID-19 transmission. Uh, populations who are friends with each other or have family connections are more likely to come in contact. So in the early days of the pandemic, it, it's, uh, we had researcher partners who found that, that the social connectedness index was also a reliable predictor of COVID-19. And so while we'll focus the majority of today's session on the relative wealth index, which was another one of our fully public and available right now tools on humanitarian data exchange, I look forward to members of this call also exploring our other tools. And again, appreciate very much the partnership with OCHA and the Center for Humanitarian Data to date to help reach uh, the right audience with the right tools, hopefully to inform humanitarian response and public policy making around the world. And with that, I'll pass it to Alex Pompey to jump into the Relative Wealth Index and how we built it. Thanks so much, Laura. We can go to the next slide. So I'm going to explain what the Relative Wealth Index is and give you a, a condensed overview of how it is constructed. And then Josh will tell you how it's been used uh, to produce real world impact uh, since its release. So our problem statement that we're trying to solve by building this data set is to better understand how wealth is distributed over space or how we might be able to compare wealth distribution within a country. Next slide. Now to, to give you a preview, this is what the data set looks like. We're, it, there's only five columns, so hopefully you're not getting scared yet. Those first three columns uh, are just dis describing where on the Earth's surface we are going to measure the relative wealth index. So a quad key is like uh, an address you can think of that describes a grid tile or a square on the Earth's surface. In this case, it's around 2.4 kilometers square in size. So pretty high resolution. And then we also provide the, the centroid, the latitude and longitude coordinates of the center of that uh, tile square. And then we give you two different values. Our relative wealth index estimate for that tile, it's a number between negative 10 and 10. The smaller the number, the more we estimate that there is poverty concentrated there, and the larger the number, the more we think wealth is distributed there. The vast majority of relative wealth index values are between negative two and two. There's a long tail that can reach all the way to negative 10 to 10, but you'll notice that many of the values cluster near zero. And then since this is uh, an estimate using uh, a, a machine learning model, we also can uh, produce our, the error, the, the uncertainty we estimate around this relative wealth index prediction. Next slide. So if you're really, you have to get running and you just want to jump in and start playing with the data while I tell you about it, you can find it here on the Humanitarian Data Exchange. Um, the, we can drop the, the link is in the chat already or you can scan the QR code. And you can download over 100 different countries, or we have a package of 93 low and middle income countries if you want to, to really dive in deeply. Next slide. So a relative wealth index isn't something we invented. It already existed and was developed out of the, the US Agency for International Development, USAID's Demographic and Health Surveys, which is a longstanding household survey um, it takes around 90 minutes to administer. There's a lot of different questions and a variety of them uh, would be predictive of the wealth of that household. Questions like, do you own a television? How are you cooking? Is your floor made of dirt and do you have electricity? And so anytime the answer to that question would indicate wealth, we add a positive number. And anytime the answer to one of those questions indicates poverty, we add a negative number. And we add up the, the sum of all of those answers and we get a relative wealth index value between negative 10 and 10. And the DHS surveys have been administered in many countries over many years, but it hasn't been administered to, to everywhere. 
it hasn't been administered to every household. So what we're trying to solve for is let's predict what the result of this relative wealth index questions would be if that survey had been administered in every 2.4 kilometer square tile on the Earth's surface. And we're going to, I'll explain to you how we're going to make that prediction. Next slide. So a simple way to make such a prediction is shown here. Maybe we just have two axes, an x-axis and a y-axis, and the features or the inputs to our predictive model if for this simple version are going to be population density and wireless connectivity. And so we look at those two values, what is the population density of the tile and the wireless connectivity levels of the tile, and we can make an RWI prediction. Next slide. However, we're not limited to just two axes. Um, we're working with very large uh, computation resources at, at Meta. Um, and so we can add many new axes, all of which are shown here. So these are called the features or the inputs to our predictive model. And actually almost all of them are public. We can see open street maps is used for urban and road density. We use elevation and slope to define topography. We use weather data. We use those population density estimates at 30 meters that Laura mentioned earlier. And then we have five different features that come from the connectivity data uh, of, of Facebook users around the globe. We look at nighttime light levels coming from satellite imagery. And then we do uh, a very large spatial regression using satellite imagery. Next slide. And we're being a bit cheeky here because this satellite imagery feature isn't just one axis. It's actually many thousand that we reduce down and use around the top 250 or so. So let me explain how we do that because this is the main contribution that Facebook made alongside uh, all of the other work that was primarily from UC Berkeley. Next slide. So what you're seeing here is our satellite imagery layer. It's a cloudless mosaic um, purchased from Maxar. And so what they do is put together different pictures from the Earth's surface taken from space um, from different dates to show you what the Earth would look like from above if there weren't any clouds. And we need to be able to see through those clouds um, for what I'm going to describe. Next slide. So what we do is we break that Earth's surface into the 2.4 kilometer meter tiles. Um, so then we have a bunch of smaller images or like pixels in our image, and you can see those on the left. And then what we're going to do is train a different uh, machine vision algorithm that's going to look for kind of shapes. How many parallel lines are there? How many squares? How many angles? And this machine vision algorithm learns how to uh, extract many, many thousands of different shapes. And then it combines them together using a technique called principal component analysis to really uh, reduce down this complexity and what you can think of this is, is that we're trying to measure with this machine vision capability how much infrastructure and how much influence humans have had on the natural environment. And this can be detected by looking for ever increasingly complex shapes. So the more complex, we, complex shapes we extract from the imagery, the larger that positive value will be to our relative wealth index prediction because we expect that there's more wealth distributed there due to the infrastructure. Next slide. So here is uh, a graph from a paper that we'll drop the link to in the chat. But what is the predictive power of each of those different axes, each of those different features into our model? We can zoom into the top, next slide, just to make it a bit clearer. So the most predictive features for our model come from the connectivity data of Facebook users. What is the average number of mobile devices, the number of Wi-Fi access points, the estimates of number of cell towers, and the ratio of Android to iOS devices in each of these 2.4 kilometer tiles. The nighttime lights radiance also has a strong predictive capability in our model's outputs when we compare our estimates to withheld DHS survey data. And then all of these satellite PC components, those ones in gray, each one is very small, but we have over 250 or so, the top uh, ones, that add, in each case, a little bit stronger, a little bit extra predictive capability. So when we look at all 250 of those in the long tail of contribution, 
they add up to be quite meaningful. Next slide. So the fun part is looking at all of this data on a map. I'm going to move quickly because Josh is going to go into more depth, but here's our relative wealth index. The more orange an area is, the more we estimate there to be uh, wealth distributed and the more purple, the more poverty. And the height of the bars uh, in this case is the population in each of those 2.4 kilometer tiles. Next slide. We see here the full 2.4 kilometer resolution available for Mexico, the same color gradient codifying our predictions. Next slide. Zooming in, you can see those 2.4 kilometer square tiles. And you notice there's some empty ones where we just see the satellite imagery underneath. And that comes from whenever there's, um, we predict there's fewer than 50 people living there, we remove our prediction to protect privacy. We, this is not trying to estimate household levels of wealth. It's a, a more spatially aggregated prediction of wealth, and we want to make sure that privacy is protected. Next slide. India is looking very beautiful. Next slide. And so is Indonesia. So I think with that, it's time to, to get to the exciting part and let Josh tell you how this data has been used starting in this region of the world in the Niger River Delta. Over to you, Josh. Um, I wanted to start by giving some perspective, um, which is just highlighting the fact that while the COVID pandemic has been really disruptive everywhere, it's been particularly devastating in low and middle income countries where the most recent estimates from the World Bank suggest that around 100 million new global extreme poor have been um, thrust into poverty since the beginning of the pandemic. It's really the first increase in global poverty since um, 20 or 30 years ago. Now, there's also been a massive humanitarian response um, by organizations such as OCHA, um, where if you look at a global, from a global perspective, there's been over 3,000 new targeted assistance programs that are providing benefits to almost one-fifth of the world's population. Um, total budget over a trillion dollars. But the issue I wanna highlight is that all of these targeted assistance programs um, face this challenge, which is the challenge of targeting, which is the question about how do you identify which populations should be eligible for the limited assistance that exists? Um, and if you look at low and middle income countries, the issue is that a lot of governments and humanitarian organizations lack the data they need to make these very difficult decisions. So it's, this table is highlighting just how long it's been since um, national censuses were conducted in several different countries, where that is really the, the, the style of data that you want for a targeted social assistance program. So, that's stepping from the macro down to like a very specific use case where we've been working very closely and, and this relative wealth index has come into play. Um, I, I want to just draw everyone's attention to, to the country of Togo, the small um, nation of about 10 million in West Africa. And so right at the onset of the COVID pandemic, just as they were putting in place the, the lockdown orders that stop people from working. And so this led to a rapid increase in food insecurity. Um, the government launched the Novisi program, where Novisi means solidarity in the local language. Um, to date, there are about a million beneficiaries. It's a digital program where you register using your mobile phone and you receive a payment via mobile money. So there's no real face-to-face -face interaction involved in this particular social assistance program. And it provides about $20 a month, a little bit more to women, a little bit less to men for three to five months. This is not uncommon in terms of the, the magnitude of benefits that you're seeing in a lot of COVID humanitarian response. Now, the issue that the government of Togo faced in designing and, and releasing this program, um, in particular, is they wanted to expand the program into rural areas of Togo, is that they didn't have accurate, up-to-date information on which regions of the country were wealthiest and which regions of the country were poorest. So this map on the right that I'm showing you here is um, showing you data from the most recent nationally representative survey that was conducted in Togo. Um, this particular survey was conducted in late 2018. And what I'm showing you here, even though it was a large, you know, expensive survey, I think there were about 15,000 households surveyed, um, over half of the cantons in the country, where that's the smallest administrative unit, um, didn't have any household survey. 
So, if the government's trying to make decisions about whether they should target benefits to this canton or this canton or this canton or this canton, they really just didn't have accurate data on which cantons had the highest poverty rates. And just to, you know, I'm talking about Togo, but Togo's predicament is not unusual by any means. If you look um, globally, you see over half of the poorest countries haven't completed a census in the last 10 years. Um, and more than a quarter of the world's children under five, this should say, are not registered at birth. So this is a pervasive data gap when you look at some of the world's uh, relatively poor countries. Okay, so that, that's sort of the, the setting. And then the, the, the key insight behind this work that we've done is to recognize that wealthy regions look different from poor regions. Like literally, if you're looking at them from satellite imagery, um, and so here's just two photos, this one on the left of Mexico City and this one on the right of Cape Town, South Africa. And you can see, you know, there's a wall here and the people living over here, I'll bet you are a lot wealthier than the people look at, uh, living over here. And same thing in, in, in South Africa. Now, these are very stark juxtapositions of wealth and poverty in a single image. But more generally, the insight is that if humans can recognize those differences, then perhaps we can teach a machine to as well. because. You know, you've heard a lot about artificial intelligence and machine learning, but at their core, they're sophisticated technologies for pattern recognition. And all we're doing when we're looking at these images and seeing this is wealthy and this is poor is some sophisticated pattern recognition. So I won't go into the details. Alex talked a little bit about some of them. Um, I, I'm happy to talk more about them during the Q and A if, if people want a, a, a little bit more information on how it actually works. But the idea is you take granular satellite imagery, as well as other geospatial data, such as de-identified connectivity data from Facebook, information on road density and so forth, you pass it through these machine learning algorithms and on the other end, you get for every single image. So these are 2.4 square kilometer images. You have an estimate of the relative wealth of that particular pixel or grid cell on the map of, of, of the world. And so, you know, th that's how it works. Actually, what we spent probably more time doing than actually building these estimates was validating these estimates using independent data. And this is really important because there's a lot of concern that you might be overfitting your algorithm or there might be sort of shortcuts you're taking. And so what we did is we worked with four different organizations that provided us with data that was independently co co collected. And we use that independently collected household survey data to say, okay, if we look at this data collected by the government of Nigeria, which had nothing to do with the production of the map, we say, does do, do our poverty maps constructed from satellite imagery reflect the ground truth according to the government of Nigeria's most recent nationally representative household survey? And so we do this in 18 different countries. I'm just showing you two examples here, Nigeria on the right, Togo on the left. And what we see is that if you look at the wealth of specific villages as estimated from um, you know, ground truth, nationally representative household survey data. And if you compare it to the estimated wealth based on our satellite based estimates, the relative wealth index, there's a, a, a very high correlation. You know, it's not perfect. We're not able to exactly replicate the estimates that are coming from surveys, but they're, they're, they're pretty close. And so, you know, with that in mind, I think the question is, why is this useful, right? Like we all like to look at pretty maps. Um, I actually have a live demo here. If you guys are interested, I'll give you a link at the end. Um, Alex so showed some static images, but I think the idea here you can see is this allows us to zoom in very closely on micro regions of different countries. And this is the sort of data that policymakers and humanitarian organizations typically don't have access to at such high, at high, such high spatial granularity. Okay, so how might policymakers use this? I think the idea is you start with data like this. So this is a map of Nigeria showing all of the, the locations of households that were surveyed in a recent nationally representative survey. But instead of doing what national statistical offices typically do, which is to aggregate these estimates up to a state level or a local government authority level, basically higher level admin units, what we can instead have is these very granular micro estimates. Um, and in separate work, and, and this is very intuitive, and, and I, I should say this is not just my research group, there's been decades of research that documents similar findings, that smaller geographic units allow for more granular targeting. And in turn, what that does is it helps ensure that if you have a finite budget 
you can most effectively direct money to the poorest people in, 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 in the society. And so if you're interested, again, I can talk through this, but this is showing analysis from Nigeria where we're contrasting geographically targeted humanitarian aid done at three different levels of aggregation. The, the, the war level is targets the smallest thing of like a county. The LGA level targets the next largest thing. Um, and then the state level is sort of a, a more coarse green uh, targeting. And what you see is that targeting wards, this red line, um, allows you to much more accurately reach true poor than targeting states. Because if you're targeting states, there's gonna be a lot of non-poor in the targeted states and a lot of true poor in the not targeted states. But if you can drill down to the war level, you can reduce those exclusion and inclusion errors. So let me just sort of wrap up. I think let me I'll, I'll give you two very concrete examples of how this has been used, and then maybe we can pivot to, to the question and answer. Um, so we work very closely with the government of Togo, where um, we use these micro estimates, the relative wealth index, to get this granular map of poverty and wealth in Togo. And the government of Togo used that to identify the 100 poorest cantons in the country. So essentially what we did is we helped them take the raw estimates. So the data that Alex was showing you that you can download from HDX, we aggregate it to the canton level using a, a shape file that tells us the canton boundaries and then use that those canton level aggregates to help the government identify which are the 100 poorest cantons in the country. And, and just to be clear, that's not something that they could have done without these this relative wealth index because they didn't have any other data set that would give them canton level estimates of the distribution of wealth. And so the government has already used this program in making these decisions about how to expand Novisi into rural Togo. Um, likewise, we worked with the government of Nigeria and the World Bank um, to help them target a urban social assistance program where they really wanted to look to drill down into urban areas of Nigeria and target benefits to the poorest neighborhoods or in, in Nigeria, they're called urban wards. Um, and so to date, I think there's a bit about 2 million beneficiaries. This is a little bit old that have benefited from this program. This is showing an interactive map that we built for the, the Nigerian government, again, based on the relative wealth index, but just to allow them to visualize and explore the geographic distribution of poverty that would then allow them to see where benefits would flow. Okay, that's it. The last slide I have is just some concluding remarks. Um, I think uh, hopefully it's clear, but by making this data set publicly available, we're hoping that it can enable development practitioners, policymakers, researchers um, to just do things that might otherwise be difficult. I think um, I, I, by no means do I want to suggest that um, these maps, these satellite based estimates should replace traditional data collection, traditional household on the ground survey based data. Um, that data is much richer, it's much more multifaceted, and it serves many different uses that these poverty maps will never be able to satisfy. At the same time, there are times like in the middle of a COVID crisis where you need to have a rough estimate of the distribution of wealth and poverty. And I think these maps can provide a first step in that direction. So if you want to explore the actual map, the interactive demo that you saw earlier, here's the URL. Um, I think everyone hopefully is familiar with uh, the, the HDX and just search for relative wealth index there. And then if you're interested in some of the details of how the estimates were produced and how we validated them and some of the use cases to date, um, this article just came out, I think, two weeks ago in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, uh, and the title is here. If you search for that, you'll find it. Uh, my contact information and my lab's information is here. Thank you very much, Joshua, and thank you, Alex, as well as Laura, for the presentation. It's very, very insightful. So, mindful of time, let's now move right into the panel discussion. So, there are, very, uh, there are several questions coming in the chat box, but uh, to start with, let me ask uh, one of the questions on frequency of updates. Uh, so we noticed some of the data sets are you know, from April 2021, May 2021, and a few from January 2022. So uh, the question is, what would be the, frequ the frequency of updates um, going forward uh, on these data sets? Um, sure. Feel free to jump in. I'm yeah. happy to take that one. Yeah, this is a question we get very frequently. So, as much as we would like to be able to update the relative wealth index every six months, every year, the reality is, is we're constrained by the amount of um, training data that's available. So, for those of you who track the 
um, USAID DHS surveys, uh, you may have noticed that there was only one new DHS released for the entire year of 2021 in Kenya. And so without additional training data, it's very hard to uh, update the model in a way that we would like. So what we envision is for, if we're able to, as more DHS surveys come out, um, maybe in batches every three to five years, that would be very good timing to update the model as a whole. But um, you know, we're at the end of the day, we're we're doing predictions that rely on strong input data, and we want to make sure that we're we're training the data set most accurately based on ground truth information sets, and that is just not updated very often. So right now, it's it's probably going to be every few years that we're able to update the data set. Let me just chime in there too, and, and maybe this yeah. will more directly address Anthony's question that I've just sort of been scrolling through the chat as as Laura was talking. Um, so you know, Anthony's correct that. In the paper, we use data basically since any country that has a publicly available demographic and health survey since 2000 to provide training data for the model. Um, and obviously, a lot has changed since 2002 in Indonesia. Um, it turns out, I mean, I want to say make two points. One, in the paper, we do a lot of analysis where we say, what if we train our models using fewer data sets, but all from more recent years? So, for instance, if we only look at data that's been uh, survey data since 2015, we can do the same exercise, but there's a lot fewer countries that have data since 2015. And so what you find is that um, on the one hand, you're maybe getting uh, increasing your accuracy by having more recent data. But on the other hand, you're decreasing your accuracy by having less global, less representative training data. And so th that trade-off, it's not obvious how it falls. And so that's why we do empirical tests. And it turns out that using a wider set of training data from a larger range of years is actually a little bit more accurate in the end. Now, the second point I wanna make is a little bit more fundamental. And, and, and you know, Laura provided a good perspective on realistically how frequently we might be able to update the, the maps. Uh, but I think it's important to keep in mind um, what that means, right? The fact that we're training these models using two decades of data, it means that what the model is capturing is, is something more like permanent income or the, you know, the, the, the stable, constant spatial distribution of relative wealth and poverty rather than sort of dynamic responses, right? Because if you look at the global distribution of wealth and poverty, some of it is static and it, you know, it doesn't change a lot over time and some of it is dynamic. And there's been a lot of research on poverty dynamics and poverty stasis. But what these maps are catching is much more the static distribution of, of, of wealth and poverty. And so, you know, I think that should inform the sort of use cases. Um, if you if you want to know, for instance, there's a, a massive uh, uh, natural disaster in location X whose income has changed most as a result of that natural disaster. These maps are not the solution. What these maps will tell you is, you know, in the 10 year period before that crisis, what regions of the country were most vulnerable. And, you know, that might translate to the people that were most impacted by the, the crisis, but not necessarily. Great, thank you very much for that. Um, so the, the second question is on uh, poverty. There is, you know, data from the World Bank and the Oxford Poverty Humanitarian Human Development Initiative, which, uh, which are both available on HDX. Uh, so, how does the Related Wealth Index uh, compare to such types of uh, institutional poverty indexes? Maybe, uh, Laurie, you want to take that? Sure, I'll answer quickly, but then uh, Josh, please also jump in. So, I think um, there are a range of, of differences. I think one of the things that I find most distinct about the Relative Wealth Index, somewhat akin to our population density maps, is the granularity of estimates. So 2.4 kilometer resolution is much more granular than typical other poverty estimates. And so if you're using the relative wealth index as compared to other sort of household surveys that might be aggregated at the municipality level or the ward level, as Josh mentioned during his presentation, you're able to capture a larger share of the truly poor population. Um, some of the work that Josh has done in, in Nigeria, I think is a good example, where through the targeting exercise using sort of household data alone, you might have assumed that a state like Kano State was sort of sufficiently high income to not have anybody in that area be eligible for the program. But if you actually use tools like the Relative Wealth Index, you'll find, as many of you who work across the developing world know, there are pockets of poverty. You can have very small neighborhoods, even within a rich state, 
um, that have truly poor people that should be considered eligible for social protection programs. And so for me, that's kind of my favorite differentiator. In addition to all the cool non-traditional satellite imagery and connectivity data that we use as an input at the end of the day from a user perspective, I think it's the granularity of targeting that it enables. I don't know, Josh, if you have more to add. Um, I'll just jump in briefly. So, um, as we were constructing and validating this data set, we, we spent a lot of time doing an inventory of other data sets that were available other than the demographic and health surveys, like the, U the Mike's data set or some of the World Bank data sets or census microdata data sets. Um, and we made a decision to, to train the model using the DHS because it was the most globally available data set. We, we were able to get da DHS data from 56 different countries. Um, and then, but then in the paper, what we do is we use those other data sets and in particular census data sets from, I believe, 16 or 17 different countries where we were able to get the micro data to conduct the sort of validation exercises that I described earlier, where we say, okay, we have our estimates on the left that were trained using the DHS data. We can construct, we, we can't construct micro estimates using census data or Mike's data because you don't have ge sufficiently granular geographic information in those data sets. But we can construct estimates at the administrative level of poverty and wealth, you know, from census at admin two or sometimes admin three level. Well, if we aggregate our estimates to the admin two or admin three level, how do the our estimates compare to the census estimates? And, and what you see, those are the sort of uh, the maps I showed you, the example from Togo in Nigeria, where we see a very high correlation. Um, now, I, I agree that an alternative approach would be to say, give us all the survey data possible from, from uh, DHS, from Mike's, from census in order to train these models, but you'd have to be able to standardize those survey data and have geographic information at a way that is not currently possible. So, you know, I think this also speaks to some of the questions about how often might we update these maps. I think one thing coming out of this is it's very clear that if some of these on the ground data collection efforts could standardize a little bit, you know, they don't have to use the same survey instrument, but if every survey asked the same 12 questions, right, as like one of the modules, and every survey provided geospatial information at the same granularity or form, granularity or format, that would really facilitate the sort of global dynamic mapping exercises that people have been asking about. I think the, the problem is right now that training data doesn't exist. Yeah, thank you very much for that, uh, Joshua. So there's one question coming from the audience, and uh, it's on, so the Related Wealth Index works well when compared to towns, uh, rural areas, or between cities in a country, uh, but how, does, uh, how well does it work for comparing different neighborhoods within a single or a, a large city? Yeah, I mean, I think this is a question where I, I, I hate to keep saying this, but I would sort of refer, refer you to some of the details that are in the paper, because I, I think there's a, a key point here that I support 100%, which is that a lot of the accuracy in these models comes from being able to differentiate between, you know, wealthy, truly wealthy, which are often in urban areas, and truly poor, which are often in rural areas. But we do a lot of analysis that compares specifically within rural areas and within urban areas. Um, in particular, through some of the validation exercises that I talked about earlier, and as expected, the, you know, the, the predictive power, like the R squared values that we get, if we only look at rural areas are not as high if, as if we look at the entire nation as a whole, but they're still, you know, above, you know, you're explaining more than 50% of the variation of wealth. It's not 80% like it is in, in when you're looking at the entire country, but it's also still useful, at least for certain applications and use cases. Great. So, uh, uh, continuing from that use cases, um, there's a question if there has been, you know, other use cases that you have seen the related wealth index being used in some other way or context besides the examples you presented uh, earlier. Do our best to to keep a, a running log of all the known instances. Uh, one of the disadvantages of the reach of the wonderful reach of, of HDX is that uh, I can be used for many things. And so please, if you're using it, you can report back to us and then we try and keep all of those um, 
cataloged on the Data for Good website of Meta, and I'll provide a link in the chat um, because it's updated dynamically. Um, but we'd love to hear more, and we'd love to hear feedback on, on where the, it hasn't worked so well and where it has worked well to help inform work going forward. I, I don't have a lot to add. It also it is sort of publicly available, which I think is was always our intended goal. I get idiosyncratic emails, like one off, where like someone says, "Hey, I saw your name on this paper. Can you tell me more?" And and you know, from those emails, I can tell that you know the World Bank is using it. Um, different organizations within the UN are using it, uh, and a lot of researchers are using it that are sort of doing this sort of work that I do. Um, but I don't think we had, maybe that's something we could do is, is try and have like a, a poll or survey to, to get a better sense and get feedback on how it's being used and how it might be made more useful. I think that's a great point. Awesome. Uh, I, I think it also uh, it relates to how the Related Wealth Index is uh, being used. And, um, you know, the question is, have, have, have you done any analysis of the Related Wealth Index data? and the frequency or incidence of uh, different kinds of conflict events uh, from ACLED. Uh, so, um, yeah, using the Related Wealth Index and, and, and uh, doing the analysis in different kinds of, you know, conflict events that are occurring in, in the countries. I mean, I'll just speak from myself and my group. We haven't done any of that analysis, and I think it would be very interesting, and I think the hope is by making this data available to researchers, it will enable that sort of analysis. I think the focus of this effort was really just on constructing and validating these micro estimates and making them publicly available. And then the hope is that it will sort of provide the foundation for other work exactly like the, the one you just described. But to my knowledge, no one has yet done that. Yeah, plus one, uh, it's like it was mentioned earlier in the natural disaster context, it, it isn't anticipated this would that wouldn't be the first application we'd look for to see perturbations at that uh, time granularity for for this type of data set. Can it inform responses to conflicts? Certainly, uh, especially in areas where it would be logistically or or cost prohibitive to to field more traditional but surgical household level measures uh, of wealth and 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 poverty. Um, so it, it's kind of a, a smeared available global layer. It doesn't replace those things, um, and it also wouldn't replace the the time granularity that that some of those more traditional elements might be able to give you. Awesome, thank you, Alex. So, uh, an audience uh, asking question whether there is a place where we could uh, get directly the relative wealth index aggregated at the smaller admin unit level, uh, COD. Uh, shared on, on HDX, and these uh, CODs are administrative boundaries and population uh, statistics that humanitarian partners endorse and agree to use in, in country. So, um, yeah, the question is, can we get the Relative Wealth Index at those uh, uh, aggregation, disaggregations? Presently, um, we just have the, the, the grid tiles. They're, they're, the tiling used is, is called a Bing, uh, Bing tile, um, and that's what the quad key address corresponds to. Um, we know that that's not the most common feature. It's um, very useful for computational efficiency um, for, for generating the and, and having all of these different features go in. So it's kind of a residual of, of that limitation. But they are quite malleable, if not the most popular. Um, they're very similar to traditional raster data. And I provided a link in the chat of um, using open source tools, how you can aggregate to, to GADM, GADM polygons for administrative units. And so maybe that gets things going. We don't necessarily have plans to start aggregating to a wide range of different administrative polygons. The, that kind of could quickly become a rabbit hole. So we hope we provided a base layer. But let us know if, if something is urgently needed. Um, we could work on the tutorial, um, figure out what uh, we do like to try as much as possible to, to take that computational burden of, of aggregations at, at this global scale and put it on ourselves where we have a lot of computational resources uh, at the company. So we're open to, to considering it. Okay, thanks, Alex. Uh, also, a, a more technical question. So, how do you manage the offsetting of GPS coordinates from DHS surveys for your analysis? Uh, this is a, another question from the audience. 
Yeah, uh, that really does sort of get into the nitty gritty details, which we haven't really talked about. Um, I'll, I'll give a short answer, but again, full details are, are in the paper. Um, so the, I think the point is that the ground truth training data is the data coming from these household surveys collected by demographic and health surveys. In the raw data you get from the from the USAID, you don't know the exact geo coordinates of the household, and, and that's done to protect the privacy of individual households. Instead, they add jitter to the household location, which I think is up to two kilometers in urban areas and up to five kilometers in rural areas. Um, so what we do is we basically take a block of, of, of data from, I'm just gonna say satellite data, but when I say satellite data, I also mean all the other geospatial data that's being used as input into the machine learning model. So we take the coordinate given by the DHS, and then we take a block of imagery around it that's sufficiently large to ensure that the, tr the true location of the household falls within that block. And then we use all of that region to train the estimates for the particular um, uh, label coming from the DHS. It's also partly why the final estimates we're providing are at the 2.4 square kilometer level. So it's technically possible for us to construct estimates down to the 30 square meter level or even smaller. But you know, the two reasons why we don't do that, one is what I just talked about. It's the there's a lot of noise in the training data. So there might be it might be a little misleading to suggest that we have estimates that are that granular. And second, we're concerned about the potential implications to, to, to privacy of revealing the estimate of wealth of a very specific location that might just be a single compound in, in a rural village. Um, it's a good question though. Um, related actually to resolution, uh, there's a question also coming from the audience. So uh, whether using satellite data with a resolution of 30 meters would be useful for the relative wealth index or even higher resolution data from drones would produce maps of greater accuracy from, for the relative wealth index. So um, that's a, a question. Yeah, no, that, that does very closely relate to what I was just talking about. Um, I think in principle, one could construct a different relative wealth index at a higher spatial granularity using the sort of data you're talking about. I think, again, the issue right now, and this is you know, circa 2020, uh, 2022, is that we don't have household survey data that's resolved to enough granularity in order to train those models that are using very, very uh, high granularity data from drones or, or high resolution satellites. So there really wouldn't be a point in just having you know, ultra granular satellite imagery if you didn't also have more accurate information on like on the ground ground truth poverty status. So it's becoming more and more common that people are conducting surveys, they're using, you know, they're actually providing the exact geo coordinates of a household and they're doing other things to protect the privacy of the households. I think as those sort of data become more and more available, that's when this sort of approach that you described will become more prominent. You know, I think one thing, if it's not clear, is that this is sort of the beginning, not the end of the conversation. To our knowledge, this is the first globally representative, or at least for all low and middle income countries, micro estimates of relative wealth and poverty. And it has limitations, right? It's, it's, it's not dynamic. It's not at 30 meters. But if this is sort of step one, we're hoping that over the coming years, people will start to collect data and be enabled to build the, you know, the thing that we want to have 10 years from now, which is truly dynamic, interactive, updating, very granular estimates of, of, of a variety of living standards, not just wealth, but things like you know, inequality and vulnerability and, and, and all of the other things that matter when you're thinking about SDGs and humanitarian work. Thank you, Joshua. Um, yeah, thank you for addressing all the questions coming from the audience. There are still a few more. Uh, so I will uh, maybe go through a couple of them. Uh, so another question on urban and rural or rural, how does the machine learning model uh, deals uh, with the differences between rural and urban areas? And many of these index, uh, inde indexes tends to have an urban bias. And so how uh, does the machine learning model with the intra-urban intra poverty issues and have you found your machine learning model to have similar issues? Uh, that's a 
another one. Right. So I addressed this briefly in response to an earlier question, which is that we do do explicit tests that ask if you look just at urban areas or if you look just at rural areas, to what extent is the model still explaining variation in ground truth uh, living standards? Um, and the answer is it, it's not as high as if you're looking across the country as a whole, but there is still predictive power. Now, I should say that there's nothing explicit that we're doing in the model training procedure to tell the model that this data is urban and this data is rural and this data point is urban and this data point is rural. Um, it, you know, it, that, that's sort of the, the, the entire paradigm of using this machine learning model. It's the same thing with the satellite imagery. We're not extracting from the satellite imagery the number of houses and the number of cars and the quality of the roofing material. We're letting the machine learning algorithm essentially learn those patterns itself. So if the algorithm learns that in these particular regions of the country, you know, wealth is higher, then, then it will do so. But if those aren't the most salient patterns that are correlated with wealth and poverty, then it won't. Um, I, I wanna also, I, I saw this question from Alex Miller that I'll, I'll just briefly address about uh, the connectivity data from, from Facebook and whether it, it sort of relates to this prior question and whether the, the connectivity data is, is, is correlated with error, especially because there's you know, usage of Facebook services is not homogeneous across space. Um, it's a similar answer that we just make connectivity data available to the model and the model can decide whether or not it's useful in predicting wealth or poverty or not. Um, and importantly, there's nothing causal here. We're not saying that people who use particular services are, more, are going to be more wealthy. We're just saying that if you look globally, you know, acknowledging that there's different patterns and, and disparities in access to and use in different services, that information may or may not be predictive of the underlying poverty status of households living in that area. So we're, we're sort of agnostic. Our, our intent is to really just give the model access to as much data as possible because the model is a very sophisticated technology for pattern recognition. And we let the model tell us what patterns it observes. Thank you so much, panelists. I think this now brings us to the close of our deep dive webinar. The center please asks that you fill out our webinar survey. You'll find the link in the chat box. We'll also be in touch with you via email with the link as well as the materials that you asked for. Feel free to visit the center's website and sign up to our mailing list for the latest updates and announcements of future events. Thank you so much to our panelists and thank you for joining us. See you next time.